And I officially welcome everybody to the California Master Beekeeper Program Camp webinar series. This is our final webinar for 2020, a memorable and rather remarkable year for all of us, I'm sure. And I just wanted to, as I, I mentioned to those who ha are still arriving, any questions that you have for our guests this evening, if you could just put them in the chat as, as they come to you, we'll address them at the end of our time together. Um, and of course, we're recording this, so thanks for muting and thank you for keeping your cameras turned off. Um, and I just want to say a very, very warm welcome to Ethel Villalobos and Scott Nikedu to our final camp webinar for 2020. Um, Scott and Ethel represent, they, they hail from Hawaii, and uh, they uh, have collaborated in developing the UH Honeybee Project at the University of Hawaii. And the UH Honeybee Project conducts pure research on bee biology and bee health and responds to the needs of beekeepers and farmers uh, who utilize honeybees for honey production and crop pollination. So their research includes three really important components to bee health. One is talking about pests, which is what we're here to do. Um, disease and of course nutrition right so their outreach and extension efforts all focus on pretty local techniques really for honeybee best management practices and supplemental nutrition and their education efforts engage students from all ages like k right through to college and beekeepers and farmers as well of which we are students and beekeepers and there are likely some farmers on the call too so um we're just grateful that they're here this evening to share their experience their knowledge their skills and some personal stories uh, and again, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you might not want to be eating while you're looking at any of these pictures uh, and because uh, they know quite a bit about this very pervasive pest. And um, before I turn it over, as I'm, as I'm actually working on doing this screen sharing, Ethel and Scott, could you just fill us in, please? How long have you been working in honeybees? And how long have you guys been working together? Well, let's see. Uh, I started on the other side of honeybees. I started with native bees. In actually, part of my work was done in California. Part was done near Eureka. So, oh wow, <laughs> a long time ago. Huh. And uh, and then switch over to honeybees a little over a decade ago. Um, Scott. I've worked with honeybees for, oh, God, 16, 17 years. As started as an undergraduate at the University of Hawaii, working on my psychology degree. And it was on learning and memory in honeybees. Oh, so wow. I did a lot of like, like testing with a, a professor there, teaching bees how to do things. That's and fascinating. From, yeah, and from there, I got hooked on to beekeeping because when I was an undergraduate, we didn't have Varroa in Hawaii at the time. Mm -hmm. And three years in, Varroa hit, and that's when um, my professor said, work with the beekeeper on controlling the mites. And mm -hmm. from there, I worked for Dr. Villalobos as a research technician doing essentially just a lot of research and working with beekeepers. And yeah, and currently I'm actually working in Arizona with Africanized bees. And that's what we're collaborating on. So yeah. right wow. now we're in yeah. Arizona, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hence the sweaters. 
Well, it it looks as though we'll have to have you back to discuss uh, Africanized uh, bees as well, because I know that there are several individuals on this call who are really interested in in that topic. So thank you. Warm welcome. Warm welcome from the camp. And thank, thank you. Me. Thank you for sharing your um, your time with us this evening. Um, and I I'm I can call myself a friend of of you both as well, because you've hosted me on your beautiful island of Hawaii a few times and I've been in the lab and I've I've really enjoyed learning with you over the past few years. So um, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to invite you to start sharing your screen. Okay. So here we go. And I'm going to remind everybody once again, thank you in advance for putting all of your questions in the chat to everyone. Put the questions in the chat to everyone in the meeting. It's easier to keep track of that way. Thank you. And uh, we will address them after the presentation. So thank you. Let's, uh, let's hear from Scott and Ethel. Thanks so much, Wendy. Um, so, number one, um, this presentation is, like you said, local to some extent, and what I want to point out is that what we would like to share is our experience with the beetle, and we have experience in Hawaii and in Costa Rica, both of which are more tropical places than where you guys are. However, I think it's really important that um, we exchange information and we keep our eyes open because both when Varroa hit Hawaii and when Varroa and when the small high beetle arrived, we had experts from other parts of the world come over and kind of predict to us how it was gonna work out. And it really didn't work out that way. And I think there's a lot to be said to keeping your eyes open, to being flexible, to reading a lot, but not necessarily buying everything you hear or see, um, and really kind of double checking with your gut and what you're seeing in the field. And so, you know, as an introduction, I'll say, this is our experience, feel free to ask us questions. And I would love to find out more about what you're seeing. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do, and sorry about this, Wendy is gonna be kind of jumpy around is, the small high beetle represents one of those bee pests that is moving and spreading all over the world, much like Varroa did. So what I'm going to use is a old video, a couple years old, that we had done. It's a short video that will tell you a little bit more about the dispersal of the beetle across the world. So I'm going to escape my PowerPoint, go to my website, and share this video. So let me get it together and make it big. And here we go. The health of honeybees is threatened by diseases, pesticides, parasites, and now the introduction of the small hive beetle known scientifically as Athena tomita. The small hive beetle has added a new source of concern for beekeepers. The beetle is native to South Africa, but has recently expanded its range to a global scale. It was discovered in the southern US in 1996, appeared in Mexico in 2007, and has since been moving south towards Central America. The beetle was also recently discovered in Brazil. In Europe, the first reports of the beetle came from Portugal, where the infection was contained in 2004. Sadly, the beetle was discovered again in 2014 in southern Italy, where it appears to be already established in a large area. The life cycle of the small hive beetle is tightly linked to honeybees. The adult beetles have a keen sense of smell and can fly great distances searching for a bee colony. The hive provides various food resources for the small hive beetle, these include honey, pollen, bee larvae, pupae, and even dead bees. The beetles mate inside the hive, and when conditions are suitable, they lay eggs in small groups. It's estimated that a female can lay between one and 2,000 eggs in her lifetime. 
The small hive beetle larvae emerge from their eggs after only a day or two. Their diet is very similar to that of the adult beetles. The fecal products of the beetle have a kind of yeast that ferments the honey. One of the first signs is being overwhelmed by the small hive beetle is that the frames appear shiny, almost as if wet. The honey ferments and becomes much more liquid-like, and during the last stages of the collapse of the colony, the hive smells like rotten oranges. Once the honey is fermented, it spills out of the cells of the honeycomb. The bees refuse to clean the fermented honey, and the small hive beetle larvae destroy the cells. The honeycomb structure is lost. At the end of the larval period, the small hive beetle enters an ambulatory phase, where the larvae are very active and seek to exit the hive. The beetle larvae develop a tendency to seek light, which they were averted to previously. Following the light, the larvae exit the hive for the first time in search of the soil, where they will complete development into adults. The length of the pupation period is variable, depending on ambient temperatures and the rainfall in the region. In warm and wet places, the pupation stage can be completed in fewer than 15 days. Realizing the damage potential of the small hive beetle is the first step in the development of strategies to protect the apiaries. Monitoring and controlling this pest is facilitated by focusing on the adult beetle and not the larval stage. The larvae of the beetle cause extensive damage to the hive, and any strategy designed to protect the bees must put emphasis on reducing the chances of adult beetles reproducing and, consequently, avoiding the appearance of larvae in the colony. Once beetle larvae are abundant in the colony, it can be difficult to avoid total colony collapse. Honeybees cannot bite or sting the adult beetles because they tend to flatten their bodies against the surface and hide their legs underneath their body. This behavior has been described as turtling. The slippery smooth back of the adult beetles and their turtling behavior constitutes an effective defense against the bees. Nevertheless, the bees still chase and aggressively pursue the adult beetles inside the hive. These defensive bee behaviors can be very useful when using beetle traps to control their density. The bee density in each frame is higher near where the bee brood is. Represented in red, the density lowers farther away from that nucleus, the yellow areas of the diagram. When a hive has a large bee population, the bees will chase the adult beetles towards the top part of the structure. This behavior results in fewer beetles near the brood or the pollen. Beetles are more commonly found under the lid or the inner cover, as well as the side frames of the top boxes, represented in the diagram by the purple colored areas. The effectiveness of the beetle traps depends heavily on two elements. First, the placement of the trap within the hive. Second, the density of the bees within the hive. There are many different types of beetle traps, but no beetle traps are effective if bee density is low. Some traps are designed to hang between the frames, in the honey super, or even between frames in the brood box. The beetles seek refuge from lights and from disturbance by the bees. In the top boxes of the hive, they find both. Placing traps on the top box allows beetles seeking refuge to enter the trap. As they enter, they fall in the container filled with oil and drown. The bees, which are larger than the beetles, cannot enter the trap, so they simply prompt the beetles to seek refuge in a death trap. The defensive behavior of the worker bees is extremely important in the control of the beetles. However, if too many boxes are placed in a weak hive, then the upper levels will not be well patrolled and the beetles will not have an incentive to flee into the traps. Thus, the trap will become less effective and the control will be diminished. This can be avoided by removing the top super or supers that are not being utilized by the bees and moving the beetle traps to the lower levels of the hive. There are also beetle traps that are placed on the floor of the colony. This seems counterproductive at first glance since the beetles accumulate to the top boxes. However, bees will chase beetles as they enter the colony and some will succeed in chasing them into these traps filled with oil or pesticides. Bottom board traps, as they are known, are also effective when colonies are open during regular management. The combination of light and smoke makes the beetles move downward towards the bottom of the hive. Beekeepers often find that inspection of the hive leads to an increased capture of small hive beetles and bottom traps. Independently of where the beetle traps are placed in the upper parts of the hive or on the bottom board, the effectiveness of the traps will depend on high bee density, traps placed in the correct areas, and reduction of unused boxes on weak colonies. 
Apis mellifera bees tend to create propolis jails for beetles. The adult bees corral the beetles in the corners of edges of the top box. These natural jails are not always effective and some bees even become confused and feed the beetle prisoners. The regular beekeeping maintenance and honey extraction damage the jails and release the beetles back into the hive. This does not imply that a beekeeper should shy away from working and monitoring their hive's health. It means that a beekeeper should provide alternative traps where the bees can chase the beetles and that are not destroyed by our management tactics. As a summary, we recommend that beekeepers, one, keep strong hives, two, make sure that there's a healthy queen with a good egg-laying pattern, three, use traps for beetles, four, inspect colonies regularly, five, remove unused boxes from weak colonies, this helps improve bee coverage and promotes bee beetle encounters. And six, examine and replace traps when needed. Okay, so I am gonna go back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> that was the second time that I watched that and uh, I need to watch it again. It's, uh, I've learned more the second time. So thank you for that, it was excellent. <laughs> well, um, the PowerPoint kind of repeats a little bit of it. So we'll, you know, we'll get more than we want to. Um, so one thing that I wanted to make sure that you guys have the information now in terms of the PDF that we submitted. So you can look at uh, details of the life cycle in the PDF. However, I want to emphasize a couple of things. Um, we learned this on a very, very quick fashion because Hawaii got Varroa in 2007 and then the beetle in 2010. So it was basically the end, we basically, we were hit with one pest after another. So the beekeepers and all of us had to really learn quickly what to do. So in 2008, really people discovered that Varroa was found on, on Oahu and later expanded to the big island and the beetle has spread now to all the islands and that's not been as uh, restrainable as the, the mite. So one thing that it was obvious in the PowerPoint and it will be also at the end when I'm gonna show you another video is that the life cycle has most of it is, is basically inside the colony. Your hive is the center of the universe for the beetle. There's only a short time in which the larvae are old enough, mature enough that they will seek the ground to pupate and pupation will take, will happen in the ground as soon as the adult emerges and it will be a reddish color, a dark reddish color. It will fly and try to find another beehive by scent and they're very, very good at sniffing out bees. And basically the cycle continues. So, the diagram that I have there with that looks like a ring, I guess, um, but the little tiny orange spot, the wandering larva and the pupae is a really, really, really small uh, part of their life cycle. So one of the things that I really wanna emphasize and you'll see why is that we need to concentrate on the adults. So when we open a hive in Hawaii, you will look right under on the underside of, of your cover or in the inner cover. And there will be beetles much like you see in the little picture. And the beetles are about one third of the size of a honeybee roughly. And you go, okay. And you see these beetles for a long time and long time and you wonder what's going on. Sometimes there are more, sometimes there are fewer, especially in the beginning. And then all of a sudden something happens to a colony that you were not expecting. And what you may find if you're lucky and we only have seen it a few times is a bunch of eggs. And so there is a behavior among these adult beetles that they will sensing changes in the colony. And we're gonna talk about this and it could be um, a decline in population. Um, the fact that you added more boxes, the fact that you removed some boxes for honey extraction and brought back, back wet supers. All of these changes that take place through normal management may trigger a response from the beetles. And when that happens, you have a coordinated egg laying, well, mating, then egg laying all over the hive. 
So it's really sudden and it's really coordinated. And then we get to the part that is shocking and that Wendy does not like, and it's all the larvae that are just eating everything. So honey, pollen, bees at larval stage or pupil stage, dead adult bees, they're all game. And all of it is food and all of it gets consumed. The number of larvae you can have is tremendous and you will see video evidence of that. Um, after a while, when because it's so synchronized, pretty much it happens all at the same time or less, the larvae will start moving to the bottom. And sometimes the bottom is just a liquidy mush of semi-digested everything, pollen, honey, the honey ferments, it's, it's a mess. So that image there is the larvae. You can see we had a, a deep, we propped it up and that's the bottom board and you can see the frames on the back. So all those larvae fell on their own because they're seeking a way out. And then when they land on the ground, they're quickly uh, basically bury themselves, course crew fashion, really, really fastened to the ground. So what I wanted to say, and Scott, you can add anything at any point, is that these arrows here represent what is actually the best time to do something for your hives. And that's when the beetles are adults. Um, the problem is that we tend to get confused by the behavior. You'll start seeing beetles, uh, there's one or two or, you know, now regularly we catch like 30, say, and on, on an oil trap per week in, in Hawaii. And you see them and you see them for a month and you're really freaking out the first month. And then you see in the second month and nothing has happened to your hive. And six months later, nothing has happened. And then you get into this lull of like, well, maybe my bees are just so awesome. Um, a, a year can go by, nothing happens. But what they're doing is there's a, there's a very, very, a fragile uh, balance between bees and beetles. And if we or the bees alter that balance uh, through say adding more supers, then you have more space Then your bees distribute themselves differently. The beetles may take this as an opportunity to egg lay. Um, if you do a split and again, leave too many boxes on that split, that may be a good time. So what you get then is this egg laying, this mass egg laying. And again, the eggs can hatch between one and two days. They usually laid on crevices. That picture was taken in a hive that had collapsed. So that's just weird and unusual, but they're usually pretty hidden in places where the bees cannot reach them. And then what you see is the feeding frenzy of all those larvae. And that's usually about a week's worth of time. And then within a day or two, again, maybe very coordinated, uh, you see the larvae get into that wandering moving stage. And then when they land on the ground, if you're lucky, there will be 30 seconds before they disappear underground. And that picture was taken after multiple tries of having lab rear larvae and throwing them on soil and rushing to take a picture <laughs> before they disappear. True or not true, Scott? Yeah. It's incredibly fast. So what, this, what we're trying to say with this is if you're gonna do anything, do it as the adults. The rest of the pictures, although they're more impactful, is you already lost your colony. And if, if you have larvae, some will escape and pupate, and you'll create your own local problem circle of, increasing numbers at your apiary. So do not let them lay eggs and have larvae develop. Anything else on this slide, Scott? No, just when you're looking at larva, um, some people always get confused at an initial stage of a small high beetle larva to a wax moth larva. And just the telltale sign is just if you see webbing. And in addition, but if you look under the microscope, you'll have in a small high beetle, you'll see little tiny spines. But just in general, like if you have like, sometimes you'll see like a larva crawling around in the hive and you'll think, oh, is it small high beetle or is it wax moth? Just look for webbing. I mean, that's the biggest thing. The, the, other, the other thing is that these guys are very hard to squish. Yeah. 
the wax moth larva, they're very soft and you can go whoosh, yeah. and that's it. These guys are hard, like yeah. really hard. Yeah. So you, you will be able to tell, but the webbing is the best. Okay, so again, what you know calls your attention the most is the, you know, the larvae that grows, the slimy, the squirmy, but that is not what you want to focus in, in, in treating for. You want to avoid that stage. So it's really important that we focus on the adult beetles and your management is going to be key in maintaining your colony safe. Um, this is a set of pictures. And again, this is the ooh, ooh, gross part. Okay, this was a picture from one of the biggest honey producers from the Big Island and the small hive beetle popped up in the Big Island first. So this was actually the first notice that something has happened. So he's texting me pictures and saying, what is this? And I'm kind of, I have no idea. Because uh, if you look at the bottom board on the right, it's just a bunch of beetles and brown goo that looks like chocolate melted something and it was absolutely gross and devastated to him and he had just recovered from oh. from varroa and figured out how to treat organically so so this was a really really big blow and he had taken a vacation for the first time in years <laughs> since varroa and he came back two weeks later to find a complete disaster in a bunch of apiaries so the other point of view is you got to make sure that you know what you're doing with the adults, because from massive egg laying to complete destruction, it will take a week. You will lose a hive in a week, no matter how strong. If, you, if it reaches that point where it's unstable against the beetles, it will go fast. So focus on the colony and the bees themselves. And we're going to talk about the kind of behaviors that they have that promote uh, that defensive behavior that you have to kind of partner with your bees and modify your management, I guess, while helping the bees fight the beetle. So first thing is your colony now is the center of the universe. This is where you're gonna focus your efforts on, not the soil, not the fruits around, not anything outside is your colony because this is the place where you're gonna be doing a lot of the actions and modifications that we normally do to colonies. Everything from honey extraction to treating for varroas, making a split, all of those things can have an impact on the small high beetle. So Scott used to have a really cute list of, remember your list about your list of things to do? For beekeeping. For beekeeping, yeah. yeah. Which was? <laughs> Which pre varroa was. Gold. And pre beetles. Yeah, pre beetles, it was pretty much one thing. Do I have a farmer's market tomorrow? And if it's yes, then go harvest the honey. And that was it. And that was in 2007. And after that, it has switched to we give a list when we teach beekeeping of probably over 25 different things a beekeeper has to look or has to think about. And when you add small high beetle into it, yeah, it, with varroa, with top, varroa, yeah. it all acts upon each other. So a lot of these things are going to impact how people beekeep. And when you saw that picture of the beekeeper who lost um, all those colonies, um, he lost, I think it was around 800 colonies. Yeah. Uh, it was in multiple apiaries. And he went from just being a regular bee, uh, before he would just beekeep and just harvest honey and, and that was it. And now when you uh, talk to him, he's actually on top of his colonies every 10 to 12 days yeah. that he's actually checking. And this is thousands of colonies. So you can imagine the impact that it has for him because now he's paying more for more labor yeah. because of all these things he needs to do in order to keep his business running and to keep his house healthy. And one thing that he's learned the hard way is that it's, it's a chain reaction. So it goes from, oh, we forgot, or we were late in treating for varroa, my colonies got weak and the small high beetle, beetle finished them off. And it's always that sequence. So he now recognizes that a lot of the, the 
conditions that made the hive susceptible to the small hive beetle destruction in a sense were his fault in the sense of not having time or forgetting to treat one apiary and boom, you know. Yeah. So it, it's, it's the kind of thing that people are learning, you know, bit by bit, I guess. So um, a few recommendations and kind of based on our own experience. Okay, so honey production. Um, Beekeepers that rear queens have a very different style than beekeepers that produce honey. If you're rearing queens, you're always feeding, you have very strong colonies, you have the honey's a nuisance, you don't leave it there. Um, you want space just for bees, bees, more bees, baby brood. Okay. When you're producing honey, you usually let your hive fluctuate depending on the resources and the environment. And this can lead to, to changes in density. When your hive is low and you're not kind of not looking, you may have a beetle explosion. When that happens in that picture there of the frame, you see it looks so wet and that is not water, that is just fermented honey. Mm -hmm. So the honey from the, from the, where the beetles were feeding and the feces that contain a yeast will make the honey very, very liquidy. We had a, a very sweet beekeeper that used to tease me and said that he created a drive-by beekeeping strategy for small hive beetle. And it consisted of driving by the colony and seeing if, if honey was oozing out, then he knew he had a dead out. And it used to drive me crazy, but it was just his way of torturing me. But, um, but the point is that it, it is very obvious when that happens, if you know what you're looking for and you can spot it right away. And you, um, now you cannot mix honey that has any evidence of having been tainted in a sense by the yeast with good honey. Um, if you do, all of the honey will spoil. We had um, conferences in, in people in Mexico that produces tons of honey and where they had drums of honey explode basically out of the fermentation pressure because they try to mix it in and, you know, kind of sneak it in that, you know, in there. So, um, it's really important that you, when you take honey to the honey house, that you make sure you extract it as soon as possible. Any yeah. recommendations on that, Scott? Yeah, and the biggest one is that point number four, um, that that how Ethel is, uh, in the PowerPoint it says honey needs to be extracted within one day to avoid contamination. Uh, we've had stories of beekeepers who, us, uh, who would ha harvest the honey or just just remove the honey box, honey supers off their colonies and you know remove all the bees and put it in a storage room for later extraction and what had, what happened was that even though you got all the small high beetles out the could. adult the adult yeah. beetles that you could get rid of every single adult beetle but what has what happened was those tiny little eggs that the bees would patrol and kill and remove they were still left behind in some of the frames and what happened was those those larvae hatched, started to feed, and within uh, uh, before he could get to his extraction process, he just saw larva sliming everything inside his honey house. So when it when it when one of the main points when it comes to honey and especially honey harvesting is beekeepers need to start harvesting their their honey uh, at a essentially within the day or so uh, to prevent any of these. Uh, small high beetle from hatching and, and, and causing major damage uh, to their honey. It can, be, it can be as bad as this. I knew a beekeeper who was doing presentations to school. So he took a frame and put it, basically overnight took a frame and put it in a observation um, hive. hive. And then the next morning when he took it to the school, it, the, the honey was fermenting already because they had fewer bees than usual and uh, they couldn't chase or eat or do anything to the larvae. By the time he got to the school, there was basically already little larvae spoiling the honey. So it can happen super fast. Um, so let's see. The other thing it relates to kind of the same thing is that once you extract the honey, if you're gonna remove those supers and hopefully shrink your colony to a more defensible size, you end up with 
materials that you have to put away and you cannot put them in you know a storage that has you know so so temperatures because they will the eggs will hatch the larvae will eat you will have a mess so now you not only have to worry about wax moth you have to worry about small high beetle living in the things you took away from your bees so uh, one of the things that it says there is that dehumidifiers work very well. So if you can get a room or a container or something that you can lower the humidity below 50%, you're doing well. Uh, honeybees keep their hives at a minimum of like 60% humidity, relative humidity. You need a moist environment for the eggs, the honeybee eggs to survive. Same thing with the small hive beetles. So if you can dry them out, you will take care of the problem. I'm talking dehumidifier because freezers are more expensive to run. So that's an option. Yeah, so for dehumidifiers, what's really cool is um, a lot of our bigger producers, they'll buy a shipping container and they'll install a dehumidifier. And after they um, run, a they remove all their honey and then they pretty much, well, they let some of their um, extractive uh, supers get robbed out. And what they'll do is uh, they'll just store it in a dehumidifier, uh, in that dehumidifying unit for a certain period of time. And what it does is just kills all the eggs, eggs and larva, because they can't survive under 50% humidity. So that's one of the cool uh, things that um, some of these beekeepers have come up with. And, Unfortunately, these are for like your larger scale beekeepers who can afford this. But if you do have a co-op yeah. that can afford something like this, that everyone can use, uh, like, like, like now when people are reducing their colony sizes, it would be a, um, a really good you know, use. The bad thing again, though, is a wax moth. I mean, you may run into sometimes wax moth problems, but I'm not sure how they do in dehumidifiers. I don't know, but I'm sure they won't like it either. So. Yeah. You know, you may have to tweak the relative humidity Maybe, that yeah. you want to keep the container. At. But really, it, it like storing hives in, in like, I mean, hives, uh, frames in a plastic container and sealing it and you think it's okay, bad idea. Bad idea if there's small high beetle and, you know, high infestation levels. Yeah, just... and speaking of that, um, a lot of um, beekeepers, what they would do when they had a, like a slime out or a dead out with larva, they would just get the whole box and, and throw it and leave it in the sun. They thought it would kill it. So what they would do is they'll take the box, sorry, and then they'll put it in one of those contractor um, trash bags, those really thick trash bags, tie it up, seal it, and leave it out, and hopefully the, the larva would die. But what happened is the larva actually chewed through that plastic and then went into the ground. Yep. We saw that happen. It was like, wow. And it was like double pretty, bag, yeah. and they chew right through two bags. Yeah. And uh, so the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to bury equipment with beetle larvae because you're just giving them a free ride to pupate. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that we have used, and you'll see it later, is just soapy water. And it actually, even with soapy water, is difficult to kill them. But soapy water, at least, is not a contaminant. It's not a pesticide, per se. So it, it would be a good a good use of soapy water. Um, so let's see, next. Okay, so uh, supplemental feeding. Uh, this is a problem. If you are feeding your colonies uh, pollen patties, and if you use a whole, you know, fat pollen patty for per hive, if the density of small hive beetles is high and your colony as low bee population. And even if it has big population, the patties are, are a little too thick and a female beetle can stick her ovipositor in there, lay eggs, and the little larvae then are living and eating be basically sandwiched between the layers of the, the pollen patty. So when you go back to your colony, you may find like a whole squirmy bunch of baby beetles larvae crawling around the pollen patty. And again, once they take over, once there's some amount of fermentation, the bees are not even feeding on the pollen patty. So it's what we discover is if you take a regular pollen patty and you break it into say about fourth or fifth, it's about 100, 125 grams, you can squish it really flat between 
um, the top, of, well, the, the top bars of one box and another box on top. And that would reduce the probability that the beetles will lay eggs in there. Anything yeah. on that? Um, no, yeah, so, I mean, it, it is, again, it is still dependent upon how many beetles you have and how strong your colony is. So yeah. you can go more than 100 to 125 grams a week, uh, depending how strong your colony. I mean, we had a colony that was almost getting half a patty yeah. um, and they would just eat it up really quickly. So it, it all depends on the strength of your hive. Depending and the on, number of beetles. And the and number the, of beetles. And the level yeah. of infestation. Yeah, so yeah. just take this with a grain of salt. So it's going to be, the, you know, again, how strong your colonies are and how many beetles are in the environment. Yeah, it, it really, what Scott said, the grain of salt is needed because we've been through so many things where people tell us exactly how it's gonna play out and exactly what we should do. And it turns out that it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> so use your best, you know, bee knowledge, I guess, yeah. of your area, of your bees, of the environment to make decisions. But know and be aware that if you're, if the beetle numbers start to increase and you are feeding your bees, that you need to watch out until you know what is their ability or their levels. One thing that I also want to point out, if you read, and a lot of you guys, I'm sure I'm checking materials on the web and printed, uh, most of the materials will say queenless colonies are a target of the small hive beetle. Okay, our opinion, and I think I speak for both of us and you can interrupt Scott, is that not necessarily queenless per se. So if you have a colony that is superseding, that means it's about the same amount of bees, adult bees, it just decided to replace the queen. There's certainly gonna be a break on the brood, you know, numbers, there's going to be a slight decline on the population, but it's not huge. If that new queen succeeds in hatching, flying, mating, coming back, and uh, the laying resumes, that hive will probably be okay. There's no reason to, to fear for that hive. However, if a queen, a supersedure queen, goes out and gets eaten or comes back and it was only made it so-so and it's not a great layer and is rejected, that colony will start dwindle and dwindle and dwindling. As they dwindle, then the number of bees that is defending a certain hive space is smaller and then you're at risk. So in that sense, yes, a queenless colony can be at risk. It takes a while and you will see it going down three weeks, four weeks, they can last, but it will go down to the point where the beetles can overtake it. So that queenless colony is a target of the beetle. Well, how long do you want to leave it queenless? <laughs> and the other one is if you have a swarm. If you have a swarm, you have two big changes. If you didn't catch the swarm, you are left with about half your bees and you are left with a break in the brew cycle. So. Overall, the hive that is there is gonna be much smaller than the hive that was there the day before the swarm. So the space that you have is gonna be way big for, that, for the number of adult bees. If that happens, there's a chance that a beetle population that is sufficiently large may decide to start basically mass egg laying. Anything, Scott, to add to this? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... So the, so, well, Oops. yeah, so sorry. So the big point in this case is, yeah, it is concerning when your colonies do become queenless, but again, the, the, the main talking point here is it's still population of your bees. So if your population is big enough, it, they can handle um, a large enough small high beetle infestation. And well, I don't know if we'll have, we have a picture of it, we may be able to find one, but um, just as, as far as, an example of how many beetles it can handle. We've seen a colony handle about an infestation of a thousand beetles per day entering the colony. And this hive was strong, it was massive, and yeah. it could just fend off a thousand beetles per day entering the colony. And, so, and when it crashed, it was also massive. <laughs> yeah, and then, yeah, and then when, the, when it crashed, then you could imagine the carnage. But again, it's still, uh, Concerning when you do see splitting, and especially like if you're producing queens and things like that, when you're having a, 
uh, a mating nuke, those things are really small in population. Yeah. So you need to always be on top of, on, of, of those small colonies that are, are queenless and not lame and doesn't have a lot of, lot of population, so to speak. Yeah, so yeah. The, the frames, the bee coverage in frames needs to be really high for a nuke or a swarm or a split that you're doing. You need to be really, really careful that is packed really densely. Mm -hmm. So, um, so basically we have covered most of these things except for varroa treatment. Um, pretty much varroa treatment, one of the things that was, I guess, concerning for people in Hawaii is because we were using a lot of, well, people at the beginning were using a lot of thymol than formic and some people are beginning to use oxalic. But whenever you have fumigants that cause your bees to leave well, areas. move aside or, or, you know, basically be concerned about the fanning and, you know, there's a little displacement. What they were saying is, oh, the beetles explode and attack the hive. And it can happen, but it, you know, again, it will happen to a smaller colony rather than a bigger one. So, um, but that was one thing and, and it really hasn't been an issue for a while. No. I think people have learned a little better. Yeah, so the big one that Ethel was saying is, um, I think the biggest one was, was Formic using like Mite Away. And one of the biggest problems was people were treating on really, really weak colonies. So when they had to fan the fume again and the, the acid out, yeah. they actually would, you know, if you actually would could, could get like infrared red image inside or x-ray vision and see the bees actually move away from the Formic acid, right? And that's when if you actually would open a hive, let's say one day into a formic acid treatment and you lift a pad, you could actually see the beetles running around and, and running rough shot already starting to lay eggs. And, and the formic did not do yeah. anything. However, them, yeah. How, but... However, on a strong colony that the bees can fan, they're patrolling and there's no, like, yeah. they can just take care of these fumigants. There's, there's really no problem. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is there in the PowerPoint is that some th synthetic pesticides designed to kill varroa mite can obviously affect the beetle, but it can also affect the bees. So there's a lot of drawbacks in trying to kill, because the mite is like one step removed. It's a mite, it's not an insect, but the beetle is an insect and the bee is an insect, a lot closer. And, evolutionarily. And so some of the pesticides that people have used and continue to use in many ways illegally are really dangerous for bees. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, but for this one, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys do know that the only one that can kill that has been regulated for use on small hive beetle, as okay. well as Varroa is Checkmite Plus. Yeah. Okay. So we got to speed up. Okay. So I'll go super fast. For some of you that are getting a new infestation, I wanted to talk about the detection of a new pest and the monitoring of a pest when it's established. Um, it, it, they're two very different things. So um, I'm gonna present a little bit about the monitoring when a pest is established because the detection of a new pest, like something say moving into Humboldt or finding, you're gonna need to sample a lot more hives than you probably are going to be too happy about. And some of the strategies that I would suggest, uh, I can mention briefly at the end, but it, it is very different than the monitoring when you just wanna know how many beetles you're having. And so the example here is Scott's hand and those are all the black dots everywhere are beetles. So one of the most frustrating things about monitoring for a small high beetle is that uh, it varies. You can get 50 one day and then you can get zero the next and then you can get 200 the next and then 150 and you have no idea why that's happening. And we still have no idea, but um, it's also very hard and people have tried for decades now in all papers of trying to understand relationship between a strong hive, weak hive. What we have come to see over time is that it's usually the, the beetles tend to go in the extremes. If a hive is really weak, it's this losing population, has too much space, too many boxes, then it's 
eh, a good target. If a hive is super strong, sometimes they congregate in a very strong hive and they just hang around, like the one that Scott was talking about, the thousand small hive beetles. And they're just waiting for that critical time where that awesome amount of food is going to be available. And they can afford to do that because they're very long-lived insects. In the lab, they have lasted a year, so they can really sit and wait you know, until something happens. Um, the types of traps is like definitely all sorts of versions. Okay, so just a quick uh, breakdown of some of them. Bottom board traps are usually used in very narrow things. People modify CD cases, people buy, uh, what is it called, beetle barns? Beetle barns. Beetle barns, the black one there, and they usually use um, chemical pesticides inside. Now, yes, they can kill beetles, um, but they also tend to, the beetles tend to come out half dead, it basically get in contact with bees. Some of the plastic actually lets the pesticide uh, seep through to some extent, and it will be on the bottom board of your hive. And people in Hawaii at the beginning were going crazy, and they were putting three, four, or five of them in the bottom board, plus a couple of some in between the two boxes just for you know, good measure. And so, and some of them were using kumafos, which we know is not good for bees. And some of them were just going crazy and using all sorts of things, including, um, what's that? The combat roach bait. Yeah. Yeah. That's like one of the major things that beekeepers that we know of use for uh, small hive beetles. Um, bait is combat roach. The gel form, what they come in those little syringes. And, and it, it uh, yeah, people were using fipronil, people were using all sorts of things that are really dangerous to bees. And what we want to say is that there are ways of controlling beetles that don't even involve any pesticides. So um, when it also, when it first happened, there was the bottom board traps with oil. And what happened in Hawaii is we were predisposed to use these because people were sampling four mites with screen bottom boards. So that was like the new thing and everybody had screen bottom boards. So, you know, you just add a tray of oil underneath. So, um, and in some places it was really difficult because the terrain was broken. You're trying to get this and the oil is splashing all over. It was not fun. But they did catch a lot of beetles because there were a lot of beetles at the beginning of the, the arrival of the small hive beetle. But here's, here's a, a funny thing about this. We ended up discovering that what really promotes the movement down and the capture is us. It's us doing inspections, opening hives, lifting hives uh, with smoke, with the sunlight beetles were running down and falling into the old traps. So there wasn't any magic. There wasn't like the beetles walked in and decided to commit suicide at, as soon as they entered the hive. It was us, in a sense, pushing beetles into, into that, at least the majority of them. Then there's traps that sit between frames, like the beetle blasters and several other types. And these are usually filled with oil. Again, these usually cheapest cooking oil works just fine. So, and it will, basically the idea is that the holes in the mesh and the, the traps are small enough that the beetles will fall and um, drown in the oil and the bees will be safe. Now, little sidetrack here is that the only reason that those in-between frames work is because the bees chase the beetle and because the beetles would like to find a Sorry. crevice, a little hole, a safe spot, and they fall in there and drown. There's something that really bugs me that I need to clarify. And is that people say, oh, you know, the bottom board is the best because it's the darkest. It's like everything is dark in a colony, you know. You pretty much, if you don't have the, the cover on, everything is dark. It's not like it's gonna be particularly darker in the corner of the bottom board compared to in between the frames. Everything is gonna be dark. These guys are gonna be looking for a crevice and, you know, it can be on the top soup that they find this crevice, but it's going to be the bees chasing them that's going to make them fall. Now, some people in Hawaii are using these shop towels that they put uh, between the brood box and the honey supers. Um, the bees come and try to remove it and shred it and make lots of fibers. And sometimes the bees get stuck and the beetles get stuck. 
my feeling with these is, yeah, they seem to work, but I, uh, my biggest fear with these things is I don't know where the fibers are going. I don't know what's happening with the fibers that they end up inside on top of a larva that was developing that they end up in the honey. I have a feeling that California would be very reluctant to approve this as a uh, good method. Um, and then the natural beetle gels, these little prisons that are made out of propolis. Um, I, I, they're there. The moment you open a hive, you break them and all the beetles come out. We've seen out of a tiny prison, I have like 20, 25 beetles come out scurry. So um, I prefer that they chase them into something where they're dead than rather like a sequential, you know, capture release that, you know, when we break the prisons. Although the best thing to do is when you see that natural beetle gel, like especially the one in the corner, your best method to kill them is just use your finger or your hive tool. <laughs> I mean, the minute you see beetle, just kill them. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the best feeling ever, I must say. <laughs> so this brings me to something that is going to come up and is um, they've been for a very long time, there's been papers and suggestions and about corrugated plastic on bottom board as a way to sample. I, based on something that we're working on and will be publishing soon, this is not a very good idea. The, oh, basically the assumption with this is if you put a corrugated plastic without poison, it provides a little space where the beetles will come in and hide when they're being disturbed by the bees. It also assumes that there's a lot of beetles congregating on the bottom board. And in, to test this, what we did was we actually lifted our whole colony before inspecting it to see who was in the bottom board. And after you finish the inspection, you check the bottom board. And basically there were pretty much almost zero beetles in the bottom board and a lot more beetles on the bottom board when after. you, after you do an inspection. So I don't quite buy that this is the best placement for a, for a monitoring system. Um, but, but what Ethel said, that method, um, actually looking at your bottle board after you did your hive inspection, that's probably the best way to, to see if you have a beetle infestation. So as you're working your way down through a colony, let's say you're mm -hmm. uh, a two deeps and a super on top, start with your cover and just work your way down, leave the hive open in direct sunlight. Don't yeah. leave it like in shade because the more sun you get, the beetles will run from light and work your way down and a lot of times check your end frames first because those are the ones that have less populations of, yeah. of bees and the beetles will probably be on your very end frames and then just let it work you know take your time uh, as long as you don't have two pissy highs just work it let, it let them work and the beetles will actually move down to the very bottom board then just crack your 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 last deep or your last box and just check your bottom board and that will be like the best best solution to actually surveying for small so beetle. basically i would put traps yep. on the top where there's still enough bees not on the top where there's almost no bees you have to have bees for the traps to work and then, and then do what what scott suggested that would be like the best but it's incredibly time consuming <laughs> yeah but if so. you have you know small apiaries in various areas that would probably be uh the best like if you have an, an apiary of let's say 20 colonies in an area in humboldt let's say that would be like a really good sentinel apiary that you can actually monitor and check. And if you colonies. guys are interested, uh, please email us and we'll email you the procedure because we are working on a publication of that. So, hey, we could, you know, collaborate in some research yeah. dealing with um, a systematic way of sampling when you have beginning infestations. Right. And it's been done in places where uh, Ethel has been working with researchers in places where the beetle has just started to pop up and they've actually come up with a pretty good sampling regimen of new infestations. Yeah, and also with Africanized bees as well. So, you know, we've tested European and Africanized. But let me share with you guys real quick um, this last video. Press and it's in Spanish. What? I have to explain during the talk. You probably have to explain. Yes, I will. I will. <laughs> so um, it's a video about a what happened to a beekeeper. And 
in Hawaii after uh, there was a sudden rain and a flash flooding that took out a bunch of uh, hives in an, a in an apiary in a farm in an area called Waimanalo. So I can skip a little bit, but it, it rained a lot. It was very sudden. And a lot of his hives were basically died as they were pushed by the water and were covering mud. Um, he works as part of that co-op of beekeepers. And a lot of us showed up to help him put clean the equipment. And we were not expecting to find small hive beetles thriving in those conditions, but they did. So this is just, mostly a you cannot even leave dead hives or hives that you think you lost because you're going to create problems durante la noche del viernes 13 de abril de 2018 una tormenta con fuertes vientos y mucha lluvia afectó la parte este de la isla de so this is what was happening and it was an extreme stream rain and uh, this was from the news in Hawaii and there were all sorts of problems and this area in Waimanalo was heavily affected and it's very close to where our apiary was but our bees were spared <laughs> And this is the bees from this beekeeper collaborator. And then what we're going to see here is phone video that he took when he got there um, of the condition. And then we'll see some video we took when we got there to help him. Y cuando llegó a su pedal se encontró que muchas de sus colmenas habían sido arrancadas de sus bancos y arrastradas por el agua. So in, in one night it rained about half of what rains a whole month. Las estaban llenas de lodo, piedras, plantas y muchas abejas muertas. En total, Dennis perdió 50 colmenas esa noche. And he lost 50 colonies in touch in one apiary. So this is the, the bunch of hives that are left and there were supers and this was like two days after three about three days. about three days and there was already mold growing on the hives they were full of mud and stones and dead bees that basically really got tumbled and water i mean look at that rock inside the, the colony so things have been there and the uh, beetles were thriving so this is what was happening there's still honey there cap honey and there was still feeding on everything, everything. So it didn't matter that they got tumbled, mud cover, it was fair game. So this is us helping him clean the, the hives and look at that bottom board, squirmy um, larvae. And so we decided that to clean this where we're just gonna like kind of pressure wash the, the frames and look at all the larvae that has fallen into that big, big tub full of soap. And it was hard work. <laughs> But all of those larvae would have gone into the ground and created even a bigger local problem. So we were scraping foundation, we were scraping everything. That's a bottom board that Scott is breaking. And you can see all the larvae that were the, just from one colony. That's the bottom board from one colony and there are thousands and thousands of beetle larvae. And again, imagine that times 50. So you so, can imagine that beekeeper who lost 800 colonies, how many beetles were in the environment after that? Yeah. And this is just from 50 colonies. And I think that's just us saying bye. But yes, it was it was hard work and everything, but it was, I think, worth it. So so hopefully no one gets to that point because <laughs> it's re it's really really sad and depressing. And and the one the one big thing that that we were t telling Wendy before this was 
that the coolest thing was the whole co-op showed up to help. So, and this is during like a work week. So people would take off a day off of work and stay the whole day to help clean up the apiary so that we wouldn't have a, a massive outbreak. And because of that, uh, we really didn't have a huge small high beetle outbreak because everything was taken care of like within that week. So that's how quickly this thing can spread. And the other side point was when it first hit that beekeeper who had that huge colony loss, he put all, in contrast, he put all his supers inside a big honey house. It's this huge warehouse. And he had, I think, what, half an inch? The whole floor of the warehouse was covered with half an inch of beetle larva. It, it was a horror movie. Um, you would walk in and you had to make sure not to slip because there was fermented slippery honey all over plus squishy larvae underneath. And then on top, every time you look out of the corner of your eye to the stacks of supers, you would see things moving because there were tons of larvae still there. And what he did is he actually got, he was so desperate because they were like using shovels to, you know, fill giant buckets with the larvae. And the way to, to make it easier, he put big lights in stands. And so the larvae will crawl to the, the light. to the light stance and it would be like half a foot deep around the stance. It was, it was pretty incredible. And I can't believe I didn't take pictures or video. I don't know what I was thinking. I think I was just like, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's some things you just- Oops, I muted wanna... you, hang on. There... How did I do that? Wait, there, no, there, there are some things that you just don't, don't want to- yeah. What did I do? You turned on the volume. There you go. I don't know, the volume? Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. No, there's some things you don't want to remember and that might've been why you didn't take a picture, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, uh, I would have, in hindsight, I would have loved to have yeah. images of that. <laughs> um, I, I do want to ask a few questions. I, I know we're at eight minutes past the hour, but this is a very engaging topic. It's an important topic. So thank you for those individuals who have the time to stay on. And if you don't, we'll be, um, the, the recording will be available. So, um, you know, have, uh, tell, tell us about uh, diatomaceous earth. Tell us about um, trenching or drenching rather the, 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 the soil in front of the hives. Yeah. To me, in my opinion, as God can speak to, um, it's a bad idea. The larvae can crawl for quite a distance. So you don't know if you're drenching just for fun because the larva decided to crawl away from where you're drenching. Um, if you're in a place that rains, it will wash and end up in the rivers and then the ocean. And so it's a very temporary thing. And then on top of that, why in the world did you have larvae? <laughs> yeah. You know, you should not let the larvae take over. And that the biggest thing is if you do lose a colony, rather than drenching the soil, what I would do if you see that it's completely a goner is to take all those frames and dump it in a big bucket of soapy water and dispose of the, the stuff that needs to be disposed and wash with a light solution of Clorox the rest and then soapy water. But I would certainly, certainly avoid the drenching. Um, when the small high beetle came to Hawaii, there's a particular brand, what is it, Scott? Um, Guard Star. Guard Star, yeah, mm -hmm. that is approved for drenching soil. And all of a sudden it was completely out of stock. Like everybody just bought gallons of that stuff and then everybody soon after got discouraged because it wasn't doing anything which mm. made me happy because <laughs> it really it was just a, a big mm. contamination source right because the, the biggest thing is is yeah you you're let's say killing whatever larva is on the ground let's say you get lucky but where is the beetles coming from i mean right. you really don't know it could be coming from feral hives like beekeepers have no control over feral colonies so if those when those colonies succumb to varroa or other factors beetles will take over and you have a beetle infestation coming into your colonies so no matter what the big take-home message for this is don't focus on the larva the larva is you you focus on it if you have to clean it up okay but you don't want to have to get to that point where you have to clean it up 
And here's another little piece of information. Once you get really good with whatever trap method that you're using, that means you're actually really good at, at judging the amount of bees versus the space that the colonies are using. And you, you know, it is like you end up almost like not needing them, yeah. you know, if you can control the space, if you had frequent enough uh, examinations of the colony, but give yourself a break first and use traps, figure out if when the bees it. grow, when the bees dwindle, when the beetle population is changing, that's gonna take you at least a couple of years to figure out because the beetle population, if it gets established, will keep changing. Mm -hmm. So you need to rely on something else. Right. Um, yep. Tell us about uh, Africanized bees. Like we heard from you that uh, when bees swarm, beetles will travel with them in cluster as they swarm, but are Africanized bees or overly defensive bees, are they better able to mitigate for this pest? No. <laughs> okay. Not, not, not to my knowledge, not from the information okay. I have from Mexico and from Costa Rica. Um, no. Right. right. And, and, they, and I, yeah. I also heard that um, you can't really identify a threshold. No, which no. is also really challenging. Yes, because it, okay. So the key to this is 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 not varroa. It's not you know. So drop that idea of threshold. Just mm. look at it as an interaction between two species, the bees and the beetles. And if you the bees, the defensive army is spread out too thin, you're gonna have a, somebody's gonna slip right through and be able to egg lay. And what the beetles do is they release a pheromone that is an aggregation pheromone in their family, in that family of beetles. And in many beetles families, um, there is a lot of use of pheromones. So that attracts everybody is the, you know, come on over, everybody mate and lay. So the effect is very, very coordinated. So what you really need to get good at is to know how many beetles can a hive handle in a sense under this condition, you know, because you're gonna go crazy if you want zero beetles. Right. But, right. but you really gotta know what you're dealing with in terms of uh, the relative interaction, the densities of bees to beetles, what the effect is of adding an extra super because you really wanna take advantage of that honey flow or, you know, doing something like that or doing a split, but you do, you put, you know, the frames, you know, you put too many frames because you didn't want to have to come and, you know, add frames as they grow. And that's one thing that we learned. So for example, if you're doing a split and you have a three frames of bees from a split that you're going to put in a full size deep, you put them in the middle, you, you, I don't know how you would do it in a cold climate, but assume that you're in a warm part of the year, you put them in the middle, you don't put anything next to it. Because anything that you would add would be a, a, a hiding place, a good spot for the beetle. So just that when the bees begin to make comb right next to one of those frames, they're telling you, I need an yeah, extra yeah, frame, yeah. and then you add the extra frame. Yeah, right. it's, it's, a, it's a pain when you have to do it that way. And a lot of times those, those work with like smaller apiaries. I mean, if you have a thousand, that's, you know, you're not going to do something. Then you like put that. them in a nook. Yeah. <laughs> or you, you know, you get rid of it and you just, yeah. you know, sometimes you're just going to have to, you know, kill colonies off and, or you combine them uh, because you, you need the population to fight off like, couple beetles like but, personally and like when you're asking like uh sometimes you don't use traps like towards the end in my own personal hives in where I was at because the beetle pressure was so low and I was on top of my colonies I didn't use traps at all to me it was it, it I didn't need to because like I was able to control the space I mean I had colonies that was as tall as Ethel so it was like yeah yeah it was like stacked up with four supers on a I'm double not very deep. tall but yeah <laughs> so the double deep with four supers with bees going galore I was just too lazy to extract the honey which was really bad but I should have but um I controlled the population and the space enough that 
I didn't have a beetle problem and I just killed him when I just saw but, him. But to be honest, he also had the experience of all the years we were working at yeah. UH, collecting beetle traps every week yes. and doing, you know, sampling every week, sometimes yes. twice a week. So you do develop a sense of, uh oh, when you a problem know, occurs. When something is about to happen. Right, right, but, right. So, and you, it's a focus then too on being proactive around the reproductive system or cycle rather, because as you mentioned in your in your graph, there's only a very, very tiny uh, time where where they are uh, reproducing. And uh, we want, uh, uh, there's questions about, you know, does temperature affect uh, a small hive beetle reproduction? Does elevation affect small hive beetle reproduction? Uh, do they overwinter with the cluster? Yeah, they do. They yeah. With the cluster. yeah. There's one thing that I wanted to tell you guys. I had the unfortunate experience last December to be in California and observe some hives that were introduced that were going to be used for pollination in California that came from Georgia, Georgia that had beetles, definitely had a fair number of beetles with the cluster. And that was in December. So there were definitely beetles there. The inspection did not catch it. And again, the, oh, and the person who brought them in put them right next to some hives from Texas. So it was like, oh, look, you can have extra ones now to <laughs> move to. So, uh, and they were, you know, rearranging boxes and doing things with the two sets of bees in the same area. And you're like, ah, oh, these are small hive beetle. And also another thing that was really bad was that the, the ones from Georgia and Texas had been fed with internal feeders. If you have, of course, there was nothing right now, you know, in the internal feeders, they were all congregated, but if they would have had syrup in there, if it would have been warm enough that the beetles can go and take sips, they would have utilized that area too. So uh -huh. it's going to be and they tricky. they would have fermented the syrup. Yeah, it's very, very tricky to, you know, and the other thing that I wanted to say, the dispersion in Costa Rica and the dispersion in Central America has been very jumpy. I mean, our countries in Central America are very small and very close together, but the sequence hasn't been logical. It didn't, it's not like it came down from Mexico and was like following geography. It's people were moving. So they keep, one country was getting it before another, they should have gotten it. So it's obviously being moved by people. So it's gonna, in a place like California that has so much emphasis in pollination for almonds and for other crops, you know, raspberries, all sorts of things, there's gonna be a lot of influx. So you're gonna have little, you know, booms and little flare ups in a lot of different places. Right. You know, don't necessarily expect. Yeah, from an expert's opinion, though, my understanding, I'm and I'm nowhere the expert, I always thought that the humidity was far too low in California to be able to um, allow small hive beetle to thrive. But I've discovered recently that um, I also have seen a few in my hives. And I'm wondering yeah. what's changed. How no, come? How come? No, I have a collaborator who is in the Yucatan Peninsula in Merida. Merida has humongously nasty dry seasons and the beetles are just fine. Wow. And, and some of those hives have 200, 300 beetles per heart. Mm -hmm. And I just remember it's not affecting the adults. It, it's it, inside a hive, they keep it at yeah. around 60 degrees, right? I mean, 60% humidity. True. So, yeah, 60 to 90 percent. So the hive itself is providing an environment for the, the beetles to lay eggs. Right. So even if it's humid outside, inside the colony would be maintained and it'll be perfect for the beetle. Yeah. And this, this is why we were saying it, it is the hive is the center of your universe now. And because it is also, you know, where all the problems are happening and it, it shields the beetles from all sorts of things. Right. Sure. You know, if you're further north and you have cold winters, uh, I doubt it can reproduce, you know, once it, the fall hits. But who needs to do that if you're a long lived insect and you can just wait for the spring? Right. Uh, you know, so. And that's what happened in Ohio like a couple of years ago. 
Yeah, where we got a call. We got a call, and I think it was like five or six years ago, and they had a major outbreak once spring summer hit, and the the beetles just just overwintered in the cluster. Yeah, they, they sent us pictures that looked just like Hawaii. Yeah. Wow. So they'll overwinter and they'll just wait it out. And all of a sudden, when it, the time was right and the weaker colonies just got hammered. So I have a question regarding if you're, if you're not going to put your um, wet supers in a, a dehumidified area, can you put them in a freezer? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, describe what a big hive is. Do you want all the frames filled out? you know um say if you, if you're running uh, ten, frames. 10 frames yeah yeah i mean uh well yeah a nice full high would be a 10 frame deep but like as Essel was saying like if it gets smaller and smaller the way you reduce the space is you if you want to keep it especially for a smaller beekeeper you can and you can remove the frame or shrink it um, some people were even thinking about using one of those moving um, dividers. Dividers, I forget yeah. what you call. Yeah, follower board. Yeah, those following yeah. boards. It's like yeah. how you use a top bar hive. Yeah. Um, they were uh, trying to use that uh, so that you can keep your bees uh, warmer. Yeah. Um, but essentially, um, that and that's the thing that we I, we don't have too much experience on is the small hive beetle in a little bit what temperate more climates is what 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 they're going to do because in california do you guys keep uh uh supers for for feed in the winter uh, yes yeah How many, yeah and then that's feed for for them so i don't know what's going to happen when the beetle population gets big enough uh, if it will damage it or not if it gets warm at a certain part during winter I, I have a feeling they'll be doing exactly what the bees are doing. They'll try, they'll probably cluster. They'll try to cluster with them. The, even, okay, even in a hive, in an entrance of a hive, you see the beetles walk past bees and the bees take a side glance and it's like, oh, whatever. Um, they, I've seen them walk between the legs of bees, like just scurry underneath a bee. It, they don't elicit as much nastiness as you would think they do. Mm -hmm. And they will sneak in there with the bees in the cluster based on what I saw in California last December. Wow. Wow. And one thing that I, I heard you say loud and clear too was that the bees respond to alarm pheromone. So if I were a hive beetle, or the beetle rather responds to alarm pheromone, if I were a hive beetle and I was just flying around, am I more apt to, uh, because of my great sense of smell, uh, arrive in in a in a, a say a commercial yard versus a, a hobby yard i i don't know um okay people have done tests in the lab where they make those little you know enclosed kind of y-shaped choice right and they have a smell on one side and nothing on the other Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, the beetle responds to alarm pheromone. Oh, the beetle responds to wax. Oh, the beetle responds to pollen, honey, everything. So basically anything that smells bee or hive products, it's, it's a good sign to a beetle. Wow. The, so the problem with that was that the next step was is there are publications that were recommending do not over inspect your colonies because that would attract beetles. And it's like, no, 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 no. Because it's actually your management, your decision making, your choice of removing frames that are not being used and shoving them to one side or boxes. boxes. Those things are going to be crucial for you to help the bees maintain the upper hand or upper tarsi. Um, but you know, you can't quite uh, restrict your sampling, you know, because of that. And, and the idea can be so misunderstood. So for example, there was a, a beekeeper that had a big hive also with like thousands of beetles and he never wanted to touch it. One time he touched it and yes, this huge collection of beetles, you know, landed in the oil pan underneath. And he said, it was my inspection that caused those thousand beetles to come into the hive when I was inspecting. And you're trying to explain, no, those beetles were in your hive before you began the inspection. But it was that confusion. <laughs> that, yeah. But it, it really does help to look. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 
I think I could speak for everybody on, on this call. We have a lot to learn. Uh, I'm hearing even you as, as experts are, are still learning. Yeah. Oh, but, but if everything goes well, and I hope so, it will give you time. If you monitor, the densities did not go up very rapidly in our in our apiary. The densities did not go up very quickly in Italy. It, they didn't go up very quickly in Costa Rica. It took a couple yes. of years. So you have time, but you need to consider these things. Yeah, so, so the, the warning has, bells have gone off in a yeah, sense, yeah. yes. See, everyone has to be on board on yeah. monitoring and keeping their colonies, you know, healthy um, because that's the best way to fight off, you know, small high beetle is to, yeah. that's the way, only way you can keep the population low is if everyone's doing their job. Right. And one of the cool things, well, not cool, unfortunately, but one of the neat things you can actually tell if you're, have a new small hive beetle outbreak is if you look at the color of the beetle if they're reddish brown you know they just came out of the ground yeah so you know it's from for the first couple of days <laughs> yeah. they'll be different colors. so you know it's in your area from your area unfortunately yeah. that's good to see, know yeah if you see it black you know it could be from any time but something that's reddish brown in color it's from your area and probably within a five mile radius and so is that how far they fly? Five, ma yeah, five, five miles? miles. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, yeah, typically at night. I mean, some people say in the mornings, but we find it during we, dusk. Yeah, at dusk time, when the density was really high in Hawaii, we had some video somewhere that I didn't <laughs> get to look for, but um, of beetles flying in into swarm traps where a new swarm was just beginning and they were tracking it down and they were flying in and the little hole, the tiny little, you know, less than a quarter size diameter hole, there were beetles that were flying, didn't even need to land, just straight right through into the, into the little- Swarm traps. Yeah. Swarm trap, yeah. And you're like, wow, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. So. And the bees did nothing. They just let them through. <laughs> yeah. And, and those bees had, there were not, they were not producing an alarm pheromone or anything. It was just a beginning hive. And it was incredibly attractive for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Just like how beetles follow the swarm. Yeah. It's like future, you know, promise of the future, I guess. And it was like, if you get there first, you get first. Right. right. So what we want is to continue learning. We want to continue monitoring and we want to um, continue uh, connecting with other beekeepers in our area and yeah, yeah. Um, just be proactive in keeping healthy, strong colonies. Um, yeah, and, and again, if you guys want to and have more questions, you know, feel free. So grateful for you both, Ethel and Scott, for your valuable time and insight and expertise on, on this topic and I'm sure we're going to be in touch again soon because not only are we excited to read the uh, the research that you're going to publish on this, but I think we'd also be really interested to hear from you on Africanized bees as well. If you'd love to come back, we'd love to have you. I love those girls. Those are really good girls. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much.